Felita, it's, uh, it's great to have you uh, this morning. And um, obviously, some of you will probably know Pilita from her uh, weekly column in the FT, which is also read, of course, uh, on, on a regular basis in, in the Irish Times. And uh, I think what's interesting, obviously, Pilita has been in the FT since 2003. She has covered aviation and environment, so two critical dimensions. And, um, and you've uh, obviously also been a Washington correspondent uh, before that, so significant experience. And I guess, Pilita, my, my first question, just to go straight into it, is um, we read the FT when we want to know what's going on in the world of money and in the world of investors. And clearly, these are very disruptive times. So I wonder how our uh, investors feeling at the moment. I mean, I, I, I think we have almost forgotten that a few weeks ago, uh, the price of oil was uh, negative. Uh, uh, so, um, how do you see investors reacting in terms of the climate emergency, the opportunities that are out there, and uh, do you see a, a stronger orientation towards investing in, in, in the green agenda and in the ESG agenda? Yeah, um, well, you're right. Um, very volatile times, as we all know. Uh, in fact, um, I think if I hear one more person tell me that they feel as though they've been in a tumble dryer, which seems to have been a word <laughs> one hears constantly in almost every conversation. Um, I think I'll have to tell them to stop. I have to think of something else. But, um, yeah, I think uh, the interesting thing about sustainable investment is that we have seen, obviously, a huge amount of rising interest in it. But up until this crisis, there was always a lot of cynicism about sustainable or ESG investment um, amongst people who said uh, that it was fine in good times and it was something that um, clients of asset managers, wealth managers were happy to indulge in when uh, where things were going well, but come the next crisis and the sector would be exposed for the greenwashing sham that it was and if um, one were to listen to... Um, the most vehement critics, or um, uh, at least it would be exposed in some way. And I think the interesting thing is that so far, if we look at what's been happening in the first quarter, sustainable investing has been having a pretty good crisis. Um, there's quite a few interesting data points. You know, if you look at, say, uh, ESG exchange traded funds, they only had about two weeks of outflows up until about the third week in May, and both of them quite small. Um, if you look at things like MSCI's index of ESG companies, they outperformed the main benchmark in all the main regions of the world in the first quarter. Green bonds have been doing very well against counterparts mm. as well. Um, so, you know, I think so far I would say um, that, that ESG investing has been doing quite well, which is interesting. Of course, there's a question about why that's happening. Absolutely, yes. And, 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 and I wonder... Uh, Pilita, is if this is here to stay. You know, I think that's that's the key question we're asking. Or will our honourable investors feel, you know, this is just a, 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 while they're performing well, we'll stay here, but then maybe fossil fuels come back uh, because they're so cheap or 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 or, or, or more attractive than the, than the ESG, because that seems to be the eternal debate, isn't it? Absolutely, yes. I mean, you know, ESG advocates will say that um, in times of crisis, people notice companies that behave fairly and treat their staff and communities well, and they'll reward them after the crisis. And in fact, there is some recent research from Harvard Business School suggesting that inter institutional investors actively tried to put more money into companies that were receiving positive press coverage during the pandemic for their response to COVID-19 um, and the way they treated customers. And there's also an argument that, you know, the clean air and the, the relative quiet that a lot of us have been enduring during, during the lockdowns in cities, that, that that will enhance efforts and interest in cutting emissions and introducing electric cars and electric transport. I, I do think there's something to that, but I can also see why people argue that um, ESG ETFs, for example, are heavily weighted towards technology and healthcare, two mm. sectors doing incredibly well in this crisis. And there's also other research suggesting that at, when you ask companies if they think they're going to do more work on sustainability as a result of the pandemic, uh, fairly small numbers say they will. And one, um, one survey I saw only about 10% that were saying they would do that and about uh, nearly a third were saying um, uh, that they won't. So, 
you know, we'll we'll see how this pans out. I think a lot is going to depend on how individual countries do, and um, a lot is going to depend mm. uh, on on the, the makeup, the energy makeup of individual countries. So we'll see. Absolutely. And I mean, and talking about countries, I guess uh, there's almost like a daily call, whether it's coming from uh, academics, from civil society, from business, uh, calling for a, for a green recovery, uh, whatever that might, might be. And uh, obviously the European Union has spoken very clearly about this. Uh, I, 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 my, my question is, um, is this? Is, are you seeing a bit of a repeat, uh, Pilita, from the 2008 sort of recovery efforts, or are, are we on, on, on a track to say this is going to be a different recovery, and, and, and the green element will be will be quite prevalent? Yeah, actually, I was um, I was just doing some research on this yesterday because I was writing about it um, for this week's column, and uh, in fact, I did a fact TV search, a search of news uh, news publication databases and I did a search to see how many times the words green recovery appeared in the three years from mm -hmm. August 2007 when the crisis started uh, to August 2010 and compared that to what's happened since January 1 this year and it's actually incredibly interesting back in 2007 in the following three years the words green recovery appeared 839 times which is actually less than the 990 times they've been mentioned since January 1 this year. So I, I don't think that's a big surprise. A huge difference for the reasons that uh, you and your colleagues have, uh, have just outlined. We've obviously seen massive amount of um, uh, interest and indeed action amongst governments and companies in particular on uh, sustainable matters, uh, whether it's introducing uh, net zero targets, um, and taking action themselves, and we've seen a huge amount of interest amongst the public. Um, so the pandemic interrupted that. Um, but I think that this recovery is going to be very different to the last one, and we have to hope so, because, in fact, uh, last time around, when government started to rebuild, only about $1.06 went on sustainable infrastructure. This time around, we're seeing a huge number of companies uh, pressing governments to ensure that their recoveries are going to be green. And as, uh, as was mentioned earlier, we're starting to see a number of countries, predominantly in Europe, attach mm -hmm. green streams to their bailout conditions, as we've seen in France and Netherlands and elsewhere. But not just in Europe. You know, I think it's very interesting to see that Canada, for example, has uh, said that its funding for large employers is only going to go to companies that agree to sign up to these TCFD rules, these climate disclosure rules, where they have to explain the climate risks and opportunities to their business. Now, that is incredibly interesting um, because, of course, if that were to become widespread and mandatory, it could mean that we see quite a dramatic shift in money um, away from brown to green adventures. So, you know, we are starting to see some very interesting things that weren't happening as much, I would argue, last time around. Yeah, no, and that's 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 really interesting because uh, we need to to sustain some of those measures, and and definitely the the Canadian example is is quite inspirational. It it, it reminds me um, a decade ago when we went through the, um, the 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 bailout process for or for the banking sector here, there was a clause that maybe people still remember, but it was one of those small little clauses that it was a requirement for companies to disclose information on corporate social responsibility. Now, I I, I sincerely hope that 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 is, is is going to to stay but talking about governments pilita you know we are on the cusp of uh, forming one here um as we speak uh, hopefully <laughs> and, um, and, and and obviously there's some it's a there there is a, a a strong pressure for you know for climate being being, being a key element of, of that agenda what would you see from, from your global perspective of some of the key challenges that from a government perspective are in terms of uh, getting to that race to zero, getting to that net zero by 2050 uh, roadmap? Yeah, well, you know, in a strange way, I think uh, the pandemic has given us an insight into what it takes to actually cut emissions 
uh, sufficiently to put the world on a path towards a 1.5 degree or even 2 degree trajectory. And, you know, we can see that the economic disaster that has brought emissions down very rapidly along with everything else is not something that we, we want to prolong in any way. Um, and But it's, I think it's given us a sense uh, of the tremendous changes that are needed uh, in order to reduce emissions, not necessarily, uh, as I say, a good sense, but the, the, I, I, in each country, you know, no, no two countries are alike in a sense when it comes to the best way to cut emissions. But from an economic perspective, clearly the most efficient way to, to try to uh, reduce emissions is to bring in some form of carbon pricing or carbon tax. And I was fascinated to read, actually, that in the course of uh, the negotiations, the government formation negotiations that have been going on in Ireland, there's been discussion about um, a, a carbon tax or carbon pricing. And in fact, uh, what's so interesting, I think, is that rather than arguing, as other countries have, about whether one should be introduced or not, it's more, it seemed, as, from my reading, that to be more an argument about where the proceeds of the tax should go to, which is quite an advance on the sort of discussions that we've seen in other countries. So, you know, I do think some form of carbon pricing is the big challenge that a lot of countries face. And at the moment, the global average price of carbon is around $2 a tonne. And that's obviously far too low to bring down emissions. Uh, and so it's that I think is is something that is really going to remain a huge challenge for countries everywhere because as we've seen in my own home country of Australia, you know, governments rise and fall on carbon taxes at times, and it's a terribly difficult one to do uh, for, in many ways. Easily brought down in times of opposition. But, then, you know, the, the other problem is I think Ireland's incredibly interesting because so many greenhouse gas emissions there are coming from agriculture, which is not the case in other countries. But um, in, in Australia, it's coal. So I think it, it, each country has its version of a coal or a cow problem, and uh, that is going to be the, the challenge for governments everywhere. But I guess I think that the, the, the thing that governments have going for them in this crisis and... Uh, and hopefully during this recovery, is a huge, huge uh, increase in the number of businesses supporting the green agenda, not to mention, of course, the wider public. And that's that. That, that is promising, uh, Pili, to, to hear that that from the outside, some of our challenges are seen as as, as promising because uh, sometimes you get you get bogged down in the, in the in the detail, and and it feels like we'll never get a, on an agreement on this, which which we need. Um, we're we're almost on time, Pilita, but I'm very tempted to ask you one final question um, because you write a lot about business, and um, you know from your own perspective, and 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 obviously. You, you, you're an analyst. Uh, you observe a lot, but you're, you, you know, uh, you're also a citizen and a consumer. Um, do you think that business is 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 failing in terms of uh, telling us the, the the story of the roadmap to to net zero? Uh, are, are 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 they being clear enough on on what that journey entails as a for consumers and general public? Well, I, I wouldn't say business is failing, and, and, uh, or at least not failing any more than uh, a lot of journalists and uh, and uh, other people in the in uh, the public realm when it comes to this issue. I think the danger there is a definite danger that um, those of us who spend a lot of time thinking and what, uh, about these sorts of issues is, can often assume that there is much greater public awareness about them than there actually is. Um, and I, that really struck me last month, um, a survey came out in the UK, uh, which of course, as you know, is one of the first countries to legislate for a net zero target for 2050. Um, and a poll came out showing that only 35% of people in Britain had any awareness at all of net zero. 64% said they'd never actually heard of it. Only 3% said that they knew a lot about it. And so it was a reminder, I mm. think, that when it comes to talking about these issues, you can never simplify too much and you can never explain too much. And I think um, I would say that, you know, it's something to bear in mind for every, every report, every press release, every story that 
um, that is written that we do need to just think, you know, how does someone going to be uh, interested? What's going to be the most engaging way to talk about this? Because phrases like net zero, let alone scope one, two or three emissions, <laughs> you know, tr tremendous turnoffs for people. And um, uh, we shouldn't, we just shouldn't assume uh, a high level of knowledge about this. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And I'm sure we can do a whole list of the of the awful jargon that we've created here. And, and, and yeah, language is important. Pelita, we're going to leave it here. Uh, and thank you so much for this initial conversation. And, and of course, you'll, you'll stay until the end uh, for, for the Q&A. But uh, th thanks so much for, for your time and, and your insights, which have been extremely, extremely useful.